Welcome everyone to FX Street. It's 8 a.m. Eastern. Today's Friday, TGIF, uh, August 26, 2011. Welcome back one and all to FX Street. Great to join us. My name is Adam Rosen and we have, in about 30 minutes from now, we have uh, U.S. GDP numbers that will be released. And this morning is a very, very big morning because we know after the GDP numbers, which on its own, on their own are very big numbers. Uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern, the Fed Chairman Bernanke will make a speech in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, the Federal Reserve has its annual symposium. Last year, that's where all the Fed presidents get to get to have a chance to get together and uh, discuss monetary policy. Now, typically, this is not something. It's it's not a venue where monetary policy decisions and changes are made. It's, it was not intended uh, to be a place where the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Bernanke and Bullard and Honig and the rest of them from around the country, the Fed presidents, uh, that they would get together and say, okay, we're going to raise interest rates, so we're going to do this, we're going to buy bonds, we're going to do that. It's not the case. It's just, a, it's just a form for them to speak about the economy, but it's become a really big issue, obviously, uh, because of the economy and the state of the economy, and more so because last year during the symposium, that's when we heard the first signs, the first indications of uh, QE2, quantitative easing 2, where the Treasury bought back, where the Fed bought back $600 billion worth of long-term treasuries. It's anticipated by a lot that, that many that the Federal Reserve that, that Bernanke will announce the beginning of QE3. Not that it's going to start today, but he's going to announce the, the idea today. And there are basically a couple different options, and this all goes together with, QO, with, with GDP numbers, which we're going to get in about 30 minutes from now. But this all goes together. I think there's a couple different possibilities of what can happen. Number one, I think that Bernanke could do what a lot of a lot of a lot of people i don't know if they expect him to they hope him to do which is to stand up on a podium and say okay the economy is really bad unemployment's really high inflation's really low and we're going to initiate quantitative easing 3 we're going to buy back such and such bonds and that's what we're going to do i don't think necessarily that's going to happen for a couple different reasons i don't think that the first two quantitative easing programs are very effective, and I actually have a chart I can show you uh, exactly how, or exactly why, I should say. That's one possibility, is where they just announced QE3. And I think if that happens, I think the U.S. dollar goes down, because the quantitative easing programs in the past, they've been stimulus programs. Stimulus programs require money. They have to, the Fed has to print more money. Well, to print more money, it means that it dilutes our dollars. Every dollar that I have becomes a little bit less valuable every time the Fed prints more money because my dollars have more other dollars to compete with to buy the same food, goods and services. That's why, as the dollar's gone down over the past couple of years, partially in response, in, as a result of the stimulus plans, that's why commodity prices have gone up so much. So I think if QE3 is announced, I think you see the dollar go down. I think the other possibility is Bernanke says, you know what, we have a number of different ideas. It does not include QE3, but we have a num number of different ideas that uh, that we're considering and that although things are bad right now, we're optimistic towards the future. Basically, he doesn't give us a very big announcement, but he says, you know what, things things will be better. Which I think is maybe, I don't know if it's the best solution, but I think it's maybe that, that's, that's what a lot of people just want to hear. Is that the chairman of the Federal Reserve says, you know what, things will be better. We know unemployment is at 9 point, where are we now, 9.2% or 9.1%. Uh, we know GDP numbers as of the first quarter were barely positive, and only the latest CPI numbers are actually starting to show any kinds of gains. We just want to hear that the guy that's in charge of the economy, so to speak, will, say, will tell us, you know, we, we know that things are bad, and I think things will be better. The third possibility, and this is something that I heard an analyst say uh, earlier in the week, is that Federal Reserve Chairman Bernanke says, you know what, 
we've done all we can do. We've lowered interest rates to zero. We've held interest rates near zero for, well, 2008, so 9, 10, 11, three years already. And we've just told you that though during the last Federal Reserve meeting that we're not going to raise rates until 2013, uh, which is another two years. So we're giving you 0% interest rates for five years. We've initiated quantitative easing one, quantitative easing two, that TARP program, the Trouble Asset Relief Program. We've done everything we can do. That's the, to the extent of monetary policy that we can do. We can't do anything else. And the hands of the economy are now put in fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is Congress, the President, Washington, where they have to get together and decide, okay, you know what? Unemployment is too high. GDP is too low. We need to figure out a way to get this economy back on track. And then I think that's probably the worst case scenario because then the entire marketplace, all those buyers and sellers out there, they're going to scratch their heads and say, uh-oh, uh-oh. So now we have to wait for Congress to, to, <laughs> to, to make up their mind in order to fix the economy. And he basically leaves the, uh, what's the expression? I forgot what the expression is. He basically leaves a responsibility, puts it in, in Washington's lap. So I don't necessarily know if, if, if we want that to happen. I think if the second option occurs where Bernanke says, look, you know, we're not going to initiate QE3 because we don't think it, it will help, but we have a couple of other ideas out there, and don't worry, things will be better, I think you'll see the dollar rise, and I... Guessing you might see the stock stock market rise, although stock market uh, is down already this morning slightly. Uh, but then again, equity markets overseas have been down, uh, and the stock market's a lot more of an illogical market. Right? If I mean you really want to look to the truth, look to the bond market. That's going to give you a much better idea of what we're looking at. Uh, really quickly, let's take a look at some of the big stories today. Again, GDP numbers are in 30 minutes from now. There's so much going on. Late last night, Reserve Bank of Australia, this is from Bloomberg, Reserve Bank of Australia Governor Glenn Stevens said weaker consumer confidence driven by the route in global financial markets will help ease inflation pressures, making it prudent to sit still on interest rates. Inflation, this is a quote, inflation bears careful watching, but we can keep it under control, Stevens told the Parliamentary Committee in Melbourne. It would be reasonable to anticipate that the decline in confidence arising from the recent events internationally may well damp dampen demand somewhat compared with the outlook set out in the statement on monetary policy uh, published in early August. Stevens basically said, he says, Stevens put the bank in a neutral policy, said by an uh, interest rate strategist. What's important about this is that if you remember, not too long ago, in the past couple of weeks, we had employment numbers in Australia. Unemployment went from 4.9 to 5.1 percent, and that's significant because we usually look to Australia as a source of strength. We usually look to Australia for some sort of optimism. When things are bad in Europe and in the U.S., we can always kind of count that unemployment this is over the past couple of years, will go down in Australia and growth will continue to increase. Of course, the commodity prices, high commodity prices certainly benefit the Australian economy. It's not the only component, but it, it certainly is a big factor. When all of a sudden we see unemployment in Australia go up from 4.9 to 5.1 percent, that was unexpected, and kind of got nervous because then that source of strength starts to not look so strong. It's the same way I feel when I see uh, the zoo and iPhone numbers earlier this week. The investor, the the iPhone is what the, the investor confidence numbers, and the zoo is the business confidence numbers. Both of those numbers, which are German numbers, decline. And we look to Germany as a source of strength within the eurozone. I mean, after all, you know, all along while we've seen weakness in in and debt contagion crisis in Greece and Ireland and Italy, etc., we say, well, at least the German market's strong, at least the German economy is strong. When the strong market starts to weaken, then we start to get worried. Same thing in the U.S. Well, I know the housing market sector is weak, and I know that the banking sector is weak. Of course, Bank of America, $7 a share, but don't worry because manufacturing is strong. I start to worry when the manufacturing number, like the recent Philly Fed numbers, start to not so look so good anymore. So from Australia 
to Germany, to the manufacturing sector in the U.S., we've seen the sources of strength begin to weaken. Now, two things can happen. These sources of strength can become strong again, or we're going to have to look somewhere else for some strength. That was earlier today, and basically, oh, getting back to Australia really quickly. After the unemployment rate ticked up in Australia, there was a Goldman Sachs Australia division, I think, uh, analyst that predicted that the Reserve Bank of Australia would reduce interest rates twice this year. They're at 4.75% right now. Reserve Bank of Australia, and I think that's why you saw some weakness in the Aussie over the past couple of weeks, because it was not him alone. There was quite a few calls out there uh, predicting that the RBA would cut rates. Well, Governor Glenn Stevens last night said, you know what, things are bad, but they're not that bad. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to cut rates. On the tape, Fed's Plosser is speaking. Three elements to dissent, uh, too pessimistic on the economy, would have preferred to sit tight for a bit. Forecast for 2012 has not changed much, will be a slow recovery. Monetary policy has been extremely accommodative. If deflation was risked, then action would be called for. He says a lot can happen in two years, and the changing language was inappropriate. There is some dissent. There's some argument within uh, within the Federal Reserve. Usually they're all on the same sheet of music. The the big change, if you remember, uh, I was running for GDP numbers, another 20 minutes or so. The big change in the language, we spoke about this during our last Central Bank Review webinar here, is that in the past, let's see if I can remember this language, during the, when was the, the previous Federal Reserve meeting? I think that was in June. They basically said, you know what, things are not so good and things are probably not going to get that much better soon. And we're going to, oh yeah, we're going to keep rates low for an extended period. An extended period. That's, the Federal Reserve Central Banks typically always uses vague language because they, it's not, they don't think it's a good idea to, to, to peg, you know, the economy down to a specific date or a specific number, specific, you know, in GDP to say, you know what, we think things are bad until GDP crosses back above 3%, or we think things bad until unemployment is below 5%, because that, you know, it sort of boxes the economy into, it, it, it pegs the economy to numbers, which is not good. They like to use a vague language to give us a general sense of where we are, but yet to still convey there are a lot of factors at work that go into our decision. We're not going to simply raise interest rates because GDP goes above 3%. Well, they said, they used the words extended, we're going to keep rates low for an extended period. They changed that language during the last Federal Reserve meeting from extended period. They changed it to mid-2013. They did exactly what they usually don't do, which is put a very quantitative or qualitative, which is it, a very specific date, a very specific figure on the economy. They said, we're not going to raise rates until 2013. And I honestly, I've been thinking about this a lot. I can't. I don't know exactly why they may have done this. I mean, one idea is that the Federal Reserve says, you know, we want to give people all the confidence in the world that we're going to have low interest rates, and now is the time to invest in the U.S. economy. Now is the time not to buy bonds, but to buy stocks. Not to sit in cash, but to start new businesses. So you're going to have low rates until 2013, but I don't think that accomplishes the job. If that's there, and these are very smart individuals, I'm just guessing. But if that was their intention, I don't think that it was, I don't think it was executed very well. And I, I spoke about this during the last webinar, I think. And, uh, talk about it again. I spoke to a friend of mine recently that works in, uh, in the real estate business. It's a mortgage broker. And, Basically, my friend, I, I asked my friend, I said, listen, you're a mortgage broker. You see all the action that goes on in the real estate market. You know, is are people buying? I asked my friend. I said, are people buying? Are people buying in the U.S. yet? And my friend said, not yet. I said, but there's low interest rates. People should jump on these low interest rates. My friend said, there's that, that there's a phenomenon in the real estate industry that 
people do not rush to buy property, homes, apartments, etc., when there's low interest rates. They rush to buy when there's low interest rates and then there's the real threat, the real risk that interest rates are going to go up. Because if I tell you that there's low interest rates now, we could buy now, we could buy tomorrow, we could buy next week or maybe next year. The Federal Reserve has told us, hey, we're keeping rates low until 2013, which means if I want to buy a house, I don't, there's no rush for me. I don't need to buy a house now. I can wait until 2013 to buy a house. In fact, I think I'm definitely going to wait to, until 2013 to buy a house because I don't think the housing market's going to go up that quickly. And we know interest rates are staying low until, at least until 2013. So what's the rush? That's what the Federal Reserve is basically telling us. What's the rush? Now, like I said, these are really smart guys. So I, I sort of assume that they have, there's a bigger picture in mind. But I don't think that the catalyst to spark the economy into life is going to be the result of, of giving, giving us more cheap money and it's not going to go, and, and, and rates are not going to go for a long time. There obviously there's a much more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated reason behind this. I'm just looking at the news tape. Fed's pl uh, Plosser is speaking, so I'm just going to read the headlines here. Global uncertainty having detrimental impact on our economy. If major recession will affect our economy, he's on CNBC right now. No financial crisis being created for the U.S. We will continue to support dollar funding issues. No short-term concerns about inflation. Monetary policy is not free. I kind of agree with them. Every action will have costs. This will be a long, slow slog. He says the debate ceiling, the debate over the debt ceiling was not helpful. Uh, we need fiscal plan in place that is sustainable. That makes me kind of nervous if he's forecasting that the Federal Reserve is going to put the responsibility in the hands of Congress in Washington who determined fiscal policy. Politics generates a lot of language that seems extreme. That's true. We are polite inter internally, but we have debates. We were worried about the same things that the public does, and that should make the public feel better. I feel better already. Okay. What were we talking about? Okay, so that, again, I guess that's really the, the question that everyone is waiting for the answer is what is the Federal Reserve going to do? Are they going to, let me get rid of this article. This is UK GDP, by the way, it came in more or less in line. I have something a lot better to show you. The question is, coming out of this Jackson Hole meeting and the GDP numbers that we're going to get in about 13 minutes from now, those are really big numbers. I don't know if they picked this date coincidentally to, to make their, to make their speech. Does Bernanke have two speeches? One that he'll, that he'll read if the GDP numbers are good and one if the GDP numbers are bad? I don't think so. I would hope not. If the GDP numbers are good, does that mean he's less likely to give us QE3? And just the way I said it is actually kind of conveys, the, I think, a problem among, among, among everyone. I think that it's not the Federal Reserve that's giving us QE3 or quantitative easing 3. I mean, this is, it's, and Fed's Plaza just said it himself. He says monetary policy is not free. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Quantitative easing one, quantitative easing two, there was a very heavy cost for those stimulus programs. Uh, the cost was the weak dollar. You know, someone had to print all this money. And when they printed all this money, that weakened the dollar significantly. And it was not a cost that was only, that is only bared by U.S. consumers with a weak dollar who have to pay more for gasoline and more for cottage cheese now. The weak dollar has really put a lot of stress on the Japanese economy, on the Swiss economy, and those other export-driven economies that don't like the weak dollar. They like it when the dollar yen and the dollar Swiss go up because that means that they have uh, a little bit of an advantage as far as the currency is concerned. This weak dollar basically sparked a currency war over the past month or so. I'm sorry, I don't mean to ignore these comments. The 10-year uh, bond is up. Yeah, the yield is down, 219. We're going to talk about the bond market right now, actually. It's fascinating what's going on in the bond market. 
but these numbers are sentiment numbers, so the, uh, the DAX fall over 1,000 points, so we'll be confident in this environment. I agree with you. Uh, I actually put together a piece last night talking exactly about that, the lack of consumer confidence in the U.S., in the U.K., and in Australia. Uh, across the board, there's a lack of consumer confidence. And the, the, at the beginning, the, the center of the economy, any economy, is the consumer. If consumers consume, businesses grow, prices go up, unemployment rises, GDP rises, economies improve, interest rates go up, stock markets benefit, corporate earnings increase, everything revolves and starts from the consumer. Well, consumer confidence is low, and of course, you know, it is a little bit of a number based on sentiment. It's not 100% accurate, but we're based on sentiment. It's, we need to see improvement in consumer confidence. It's a big deal. All right, you should see a chart that I put together uh, very recently. And it shows a couple of squiggly lines, which I'll explain. The blue line is the 30-year bond. And when you when we trade foreign exchange, you know, I started out trading foreign exchange. I, my, my goal was to find a correlation, a relationship between stocks and currencies. If the stock market go, goes up, does the dollar go down? Oh, thank you very much. Um... If the stock market goes down, does the yen go up? And there are correlations that do exist from time to time. But if you want to really find, and this is amazing, if you really want to find the driver of currency, not the driver, if you want to look for the relationship in currencies or between currencies, look to their bond markets. The stock market is illogical. It's emotional. You know, we, we buy stocks. You know, you look at uh, yesterday. Bank of America, two big stories yesterday in the stock markets. To answer your question, Abel, there's really not a set, uh, there's really not a set relationship. The relationship between stocks and currencies changes. A few years ago, if you would have asked me what, uh, what the relationship was, there was, I think a friend of mine at one point told me there was a 95% correlation between the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the dollar yen. That when the Dow goes up, the dollar yen goes up, because when the Dow goes up, it means we're optimistic about the U.S. economy, and investment capital from Japan leaves Japan, sells their yens, buys stocks, but in order to buy the stocks, they have to buy U.S. dollars, so the dollar yen goes up when the Dow goes up. That used to happen. That doesn't occur anymore. For a while, there was a very, very strong correlation, but we need high interest rates in the U.S. in order for that correlation to exist. That's not the case now. So the, the connection between stock markets and currencies, uh, I'll give you an example. It's like, it's like my own personal conspiracy theory about, uh, you'll laugh about this, that the New York Yankees tend to win World Series during years when the stock market, when the Dow Jones Industrial Average is strong. You know, if you think about it, the greatest bull markets occurred in 1929 before the crash. You know, we had at that time, Babe Ruth. We had the 1960s, we had Mickey Mantle, and we had a very strong stock market. Uh, we had the late 90s, of course, a couple World Series championships, and then 2009, one of the best years in recent history. So, the correlation exists for a time, but I don't think there's any specific reason. Now, my theory is, is that when the economy is strong, maybe more people go to the games, and because more people go to the games, uh, the New York Yankees make more money, they can buy better players, who knows? It's coincidental. I know, I'm joking around. That's my explanation of the uh, relationship between the stocks and currencies. It's, it's not coincidental. It's obviously not. But there are so many different cross-currents that occur in the stock market that to peg that to a currency uh, is very, very difficult. When the stock market moves based on macroeconomic information, macroeconomic uh Events, GDP numbers, non-farm payroll, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's a correlation to an extent. But the stock market, we're waiting for GDP numbers, by the way, here, six minutes from now. Uh, the stock market moves for a lot of different reasons. You think of yesterday's trading. I watch the markets every day. I can't, I can't get enough of it. Two big stories yesterday. Bank of America and Apple. Apple Computer, the CEO, Steve Jobs, uh, 
announces that he's going to step down for personal reasons, obviously, uh, from Apple Computer, and the stock was down. Now, why was the stock down? It was 90% of the movement, I would attribute 99%, was emotional. I mean, Apple Computer, which is just an, an amazing company, has enough, has enough projects in their pipeline probably to last them for years, years and years and years. Steve Jobs is not going away. He's not, you know, tomorrow he's not going to hike up to a mountain on the top of Peru and, and mountains in Peru and that's it. You're never going to see the last of them. He's going to become the president, uh, uh, the, the, the chairman of Apple Computer. And if anything, he's probably going to have more time to dedicate just towards his vision of the products, what they should look like moving forward. And of course, there's a lot of other people involved in Apple Computer. I know Steve Jobs is, is definitely the, the visionary behind Apple, but you know, in order for them to create the iPhone, that is something that has been in the pipeline for a long time. So even if Steve Jobs stops working tomorrow, they have enough to last them a long time without having to create any new ideas. But the stock was down. Stock was down because everybody loves Steve Jobs. I love him too. I think he's great. Uh, Bank of America. Bank of America was up yesterday because Warren Buffett announced that he's going to buy a piece of Bank of America. And, and immediately people said, wow, Warren Buffett, he, he's, he's really, he's one of the most successful investors in the history of investing. And as a result, Bank of America is definitely not going out of business and this is a really good buy. If Warren Buffett's buying, then I'm buying. And there was, there's a funny story that Warren Buffett made his decision to buy Bank of America while he was sitting in the bathtub. I don't know if that makes any difference at all. Uh, Warren Buffett, if you look at the deal, actually, the deal is actually, and the stock was up. The stock was about 25%, I think, yesterday, 24% at one point. It went from 7 to 8 and the head to 8 dollars $8.30, something like that. But if you actually look at the deal, the deal is not so good for Bank of America. It's actually a pretty expensive deal for Bank of America. Warren Buffett's not buying stock. He's buying warrants. Warrants are, and this takes me back to my early Series 7 days, warrants are notes issued by a company that get a lot more priority. You know, when a company gets in trouble, the stockholders, the common shareholders, that's why they call common stock, we get out last when a company gets in trouble. You have the preferred stockholders, the uh, preferred bondholders, then you have the common bondholders, I think it's called, and then you have the common stockholder, or preferred stockholders, and, the, and then the common stockholders. When a company gets in trouble, Bank of America tomorrow says, we're going out of business. The preferred bondholders, they get their money first. Then the common bondholders, then preferred stock, then the common stock. I believe that's the way it works. Common stockholders get out last, if there's any money left to, 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 to split up. Warrants get a very high, uh, a very high priority. Uh, Warren Buffett bought the warrants, which means he's taking the safest route possible. I mean, if you really believe in Bank of America, why would he buy the warrants, which lock them in for, I think it's only a 6% yield, only until 2012. Next year, he's getting out of his investment. He's going to make a 6%, and that's that. Now, that's Warren Buffett style. He, he loves to look at a company from uh, a fundamental point of view and make sure that Hey, you know, the company is strong. It's a value play. He loves buying these value plays and holds them for a long time. He does not looking for 600,000% return. As far as Warren Buffett's thinking, well, if I keep my money in the bank, I get 0%. Or I can buy the warrant to Bank of America, which is a very safe way to invest in Bank of America. I'll get 6% and then get out next year. But the stock was up. Stock market's emotional. My point being is, if you want to look to the dollar, look to the U.S. bond markets. If you want to look to the euro, look to the German bond markets. We're expecting GDP numbers any moment now. Let's take a look at the bond markets. Uh, let's compare this here. The 10-year the ten year U.S. bonds is currently pays 1.79%. Whoops. I wish one uh twelve seventy nine. Sorry. That's one seventy nine. Correction. Okay. Well, I just heard some numbers here. Then I'll explain the chart I wanted to show you. Alrighty.
Okay, this is from FX Street. GDP was expected at 1.1%. The previous number is 1.3, below expectations, 1.0%. A little bit of a disappointment. We're going to take a look at the charts in a moment. Oh, here we go. Uh, second quarter preliminary GDP 1.0% versus advanced GDP of 1.3. That's less. Second quarter consensus of 1.0. All right, the FX Street calendar has a consensus of 1.1%. The Dow Jones newspaper has a consensus of 1.0. So we're more or less, we're going to see a little bit of variance over time uh, but, uh, between sources. It's in line to a little bit of a uh, disappointment. Second quarter preliminary real final sales up 1.2 versus advance of 1.1. That's a little better. PCE price index up 3.2 versus advance of 3.1. Uh, 2.2 versus advance of 2.1 on the second quarter preliminary core PCE price index. These are just different ways of looking at the GDP. Preliminary purchase price index up 3.3 versus advance of 3.2. That's a little bit better. Chain weighted price index of 2.4 versus 2.3. Corporate profits of 0.8 versus, that looks like a disappointment, unless I'm reading this wrong. Second quarter profits up 0.8% versus 8.7% in the first quarter. Is that right? We went from 8.7 to 0.8? We went from 8.7 to less than 1%? Let's take a look at the market to see what, how it's interpreting it. It's always difficult when there's multiple layers of these numbers. Dow Jones National Average Futures 11,124. It looks like it's starting to react a little bit to the downside. Here's the dollar Swissy, a little bit stronger. Dollar Yen, a little bit stronger, meaning we're just upticking to the smallest degree. Gold sometimes gives us the answer here. Gold, stronger as well. I would say it's inconclusive at best at the moment. Because dollar is ticking up and gold is ticking up, uh, it's not conclusive. Yeah, and dollar is supposed to here. All right, let's get back to these numbers. I agree. Stock market's waiting for Ben Bernanke. I mean, the number was not horrible and it was not great, except for those corporate profits. And I'm kind of curious if maybe... Oops. If... Uh, it, those were not reported because they made a mistake or something? Yeah, real personal consumption expenditures up 2.2 versus 0 0.2. That looks like it's much better. Gross domestic product, gross domestic purchase price index of 3.3 versus 2.3. So in some cases, it looks like the numbers are much better. But in another case, a little bit of dis disappointment. All in all, I think it's a little bit of better. The question is, what speech is Ben Bernanke going to use? All right, I want to show you a chart, and it is funny, right? <laughs> Let's look at the bond market, by the way. We said it was 1.79% on the 10-year bond before the number. I'm sorry, it wasn't 1.79%. It was down 1.79%. The bond market is now down. U.S. 10-year bonds, if the U.S. 10-year bond was 1.79%, which it still is, by the way. 10-year bonds, hey, the yield is a 2.19%. Down one point, I always look at the percentages. Down 1.9% for the day, 79% for the day. We're at 219 All right, now everyone should see a chart which I've been dying to talk about because I think this is really, really interesting and kind of scary. 
Now, if we were just to look at the stock market, and I were to ask you, I know the way I set up this question is it's a little obvious, but I were to ask you, do you think the Federal Reserve should initiate QE3? Now, you probably know by now that I think it's a bad idea. So you'll probably agree with me and say, no, that's not a good idea. Uh, but if we were to just say, ask the average stock investor, do you think the Federal Reserve should initiate QE3? I think a lot of those average, you know, shady tree uh, stock uh, stock investors say, yeah, you know, let's give the market the economy more stimulus. I mean, the economy is horrible right now. Look at unemployment. Look at, you know, inflation. GDP numbers today, I think, look kind of good. But overall, things are not good. I think the economy needs stimulus. But the question is, did the stimulus, did the stimulus plans help? Well, the stock market went up a lot over the past couple of years. It feels like they did. I mean, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 6,000 and change. It's now, even after coming down a lot, it's still in the 11,000 area. Why well, give a junkie more drugs when they're in rehab? <laughs> I, 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 listen, I think it's a great point. I, I would equate the stimulus plans to ineffective medicine. Medicine that, you know, we go to the hospital and we say, you know, we're sick, and they start to give us medicine, and the first couple of days the medicine works really, really well, but as we continue to take the medicine, it starts to wear off. And the more medicine that the doctors give us, the, the less effective it works. It's like the uh, economy is almost growing in immunity to the uh, stimulus plans. I'll show you what I mean. The blue line represents a 30-year bond. The red line represents a 10-year bond. Now, we know bond yields, and these are the bond yields, by the way. The bond yields tend to move in the same direction as the stock market. When the stocks go up, bond yields go up. When stocks go down, the bond yields go down. Okay. So obviously, and this chart goes back to 2008. So the stock market hit a bottom in early 09. Bond stocks went up. The bond market, the yields went up. And then began to fluctuate. Now, obviously, the yields don't move exactly in line with stocks because stocks doubled in two years. Bond market works in a much more of an oscillating, in an oscillating nature. Nevertheless, stocks go up, yields go up. Now, it's important to note, and I think the real truth lies in the bond yield differentials. We compare the yield of long-term bonds to short-term bonds. Again, the long-term bond is the 30-year. That's the blue line. The short-term bond is, or it's actually a medium-term thing about it, 10-year bonds, and that's the red line. Now, we can, we can compare all different types of bond yields. A, a very popular measure is a 10 to the two-year bond. I like the 30 to the 10. It seems to make a lot of sense to me. Now, what's the bond market telling us? The green line at the bottom represents the spread, the difference between the two. Right now, the 30-year bond pays a 3.56% yield. The 10-year bond, 219. We take the difference between the two. 356 minus 219 is 137. Is that right? 137. Take the 30-year bond. In fact, let's type it in. 30-year, the, the, and these are obviously the yields, uh, 3.5, I'm rounding this up, 3.57. 10-year is, uh, I'm going to round up 2.2. 3.57 minus 2.2 is 1.37. The difference is 1.37%, or 137 basis points. Basis of 100 basis points is 1%. Okay, now what is this ch chart telling us? During QE1, start the blue line on the left-hand side to the end of QE1, which is a red line in the center, yields went up because stocks went up. During that period of time, how did the bond market behave? Well, I drew these black lines to show us that the bond market, basically the, the yield differential, the difference between the 30 and the 10-year bond, 
establish a trading range at or below 1%. 1%, 0.8%, 1%, 0.7%, 0.8%, 0.7%, 0.8%, 0.7%, 0.7%, 0.7%, 0.7%, 0.7%, 0.7%, 0.7%, 0.7%, 0.7%, 0.7%
the 30-year bond, or I should say the 10-year bond pays a lot less now than it did during quantitative easing one. And I don't even mean now, I mean during quantitative easing two. Have things gotten better? The bond market is actually telling us that they th it thinks that the economy is was worse off, in a worse position during QE2 as opposed to QE1. Then what happened when QE1, uh, Q, sorry, QE2 ended June 30th? When QE2 ended June 30th, all of a sudden the bond market says, uh-oh, now we're really in trouble. The doctor gave us medicine in QE1, it stabilized the patients. Didn't make us feel very much better, stabilized us. QE1 ended. Then all of a sudden the patient went to, uh, got really, really sick. Doctor gave us more medicine. It was less effective during QE2. Then the doctor took that medicine away. And after QE2, started to get really, really sick. If we get QE3, what can we expect? Wow. It's logical to, to, to believe that, you know, I don't think that it's going to magically lead us to any sort of fantastic recovery. The best we can hope for is that the bond yield differential will widen even more. Now, what does a bond market look like during a healthy economy? You'll see the 10 and 30-year bonds very close together. That's basically what I was <laughs> alluding to. Yeah, the patient may die. Once in a while, and I don't have it on this chart, but it's fascinating to see. Once in a while, you'll see an economy that is so unbelievably strong. I'll ask anybody if, if you know what the, what, what the term is, what this is called. What do you call the, uh, the bond, I'll give you a hint, the bond curve when the economy is so strong that the short-term bonds actually give you a little bit of a higher yield than the long-term bonds. When things are so good now that, yeah, things will be better in the future, but they can't be as good as they are now. It's called an in inverted yield curve. An inverted yield curve occurred in 2006. Negative yield spread. Yeah, basically. Uh... And it occurred in 2006 when the 10-year bond actually paid a little bit of a higher yield than 30-year bonds. And if this chart had goes, goes back to 2006, you would have noticed that this red line was above the, the blue line. It forecasts, after a very strong economy, it forecasts a recession. It's a signal that we saw in 2006. It doesn't happen very often. I think it also occurred in the year 2000. Now, it, you know, we don't need to see that now for the economy to signal a recession. We're technically already in a recession because the 10 years so far below the 30 year. Uh, but what we want to see as a symptom of a recovery, in order for things to get better, we want to see the differential decrease. So every morning when, when, when you wake up, you turn to the charts and you, you go through your, your, you know, daily activity as far as, you know, we all have it, the charts that we set up, the news that we read, etc. Take two seconds. Subtract the 30-year bond yield from the 10-year uh, bond yield. Right now, 354 versus 218. What did I say before? So 357 yield went down on the 30-year one to 354. And the 220 went down to 218. So 354... Actually, 355 went to three, uh, 357, 355 went down two basis points. The 220 went down to 218. So that yield spread has maintained at 1.37% differential. Both yields are going down because I'm assuming stock futures are going down as well. I want to go back to our comments, but I don't want to ignore any of them. As long as there's no creativity in the U.S. industry to create good products and good jobs, Bernanke has to uh, feed the least probably earn money stock. <laughs> Yield differentials, uh, single best correlation uh, to FX. I agree. If you were to plot the U.S. dollar to these yield differentials, I, I don't think it's gonna it's gonna fall in a one to one exact correlation, but I think it's gonna be a lot more helpful than uh, than simply looking at the stock market. 
And if you happen to trade stocks, it's definitely in our best interest to watch the bond market. You take a look at the stock market yesterday. The stock market opened up strong, and bond yields were strong, but some late in the, in the morning, bond yields turned negative, and the stock market continued to go up. I, I, I was literally sitting there asking myself, why, why are yields negative now when stocks are up? And the next thing you know, the stock market went from going up, I think we were up 60, 70 points, I forget at one point, to down 100-something. Stock market's emotional. It's going to focus on certain stories, certain industries, and it's not weighted equally. I, I believe I saw yesterday the statistic that Apple computer stock represents 3% of, is it tech holdings? I forget. Or the S&P 500? I forget. Uh, it's, it, it's a very large component of a lot of uh, indices. Represents, I think, 10% of the NASDAQ 100. I think it represents something like, I could be wrong, 15% maybe or 5% of all mutual fund holdings. If you take a look at your mutual funds, this is a scary thing. If you own mutual funds and stocks, take a look and see how many of your mutual funds own Apple Computer. Now, it's a great company. I don't think there's any big fundamental change based on, on, uh, on the Steve Jobs news, but if, if anything were to happen to Apple Computer, that would bring down the stock market disproportionately because so many of us own Apple in stocks and in mutual funds and in pension plans. It's not the bond market. The bond market, we take a look at the 30, we compare it to the 10-year, and that's what we have. Uh, do bonds correlate with gold? Well, we know the dollar has a very strong inverse or opposite correlation with gold. When the dollar goes down, we tend to buy gold as an inflation. Now, when the dollar goes down, yields tend to go down. So we could say, yeah, when yields go down, gold goes up. But it's not a perfect correlation because the dollar does not always move in line with, uh, the, with the bond market does not necessarily move in line with the dollar. The dollar moves in anticipation of higher interest rates. And yeah, the bond market works that way too. But the bond market's also reacting to the stock market. So there are correlations. It is very helpful, though. I would encourage you, watch bonds and gold and stocks trade. You should see, what I would tell you that is this. In big moves, in big, significant market trends, you should see confirmation from different markets. If the stock market's up 100 points today, you should see yields up, and you should see gold down. But not necessarily, and not necessarily gold, because then the gold market could go up if the dollar goes down. So it's, it really depends on the story of the day. If the story of the day drives the dollar down, we could expect gold to go up. That story could affect stocks in a positive or negative correlation. I'm, I wish I could give you a more concrete answer, but this is the, this is the beauty of financial markets, is that there's not, there's not a rule I can give you yet. Every time you buy gold, it means the stocks should go up and the bonds should do this. It depends on the story. The story will affect stocks one way, bonds another way. But if we can understand why markets are reacting to news in a specific way, in a certain way, then all of a sudden that tells us the whole story. Bonds short correlate with the U.S. dollar. I agree. I think the dollar moves a lot more closely with bonds than it does with stocks. The stock market, it's... it's Fear, greed, Apple, Facebook, LinkedIn, who knows? What if all large corporations that are sitting on all their cash and uh, just give their employees a raise, I know they will take a lot of money spending and kind of will get better, it almost seems like they're holding things down on purpose, that obviously the whole piece of the government. It's, listen, it's a great question. It's a fascinating debate. Put yourself in the shoes of What's a, what's a, a, we would all love to be, you know, in charge of Apple Computer. That company just can't lose money. But think of a company, and I know I have to go in, I have to go in a few minutes here. Think of a company that, give me an example of a company that's not doing so well. Ah, Bank of America. They just had layoffs. I just heard, I don't I didn't read this news, someone told me, so I don't know if it's 100% accurate, but I think they just closed their international op operations. Stock is seven dollars a share. Now I know the, the company doesn't make money in the stock, but if the money company wants to, you know, have any sort of buying power, if it wants to reinvest, if it wants to sell some of its stock, 
to to and reinvest in the company, it's better that the stock price is high. Think of a company like Bank of America. And if you were put in the president's seat, if you became chairman of the board tomorrow of Bank of America, what would you do to bring the company back from back from despair? We could say, well, Bank of America, banks make money because they they're able to lend money to to people to buy homes and they make a higher interest rate than the money that people put in their bank savings accounts. I put money in a savings account, they pay me one percent. They take that money that I'm in my savings and they lend it to somebody else to buy a house and they buy that house and they pay five percent mortgage and the difference is what the bank makes. Well the banks aren't lending right now because there's a very real risk that if some, for every 10 people that buy a house, you know, a good amount of them may foreclose. I and mean, you look at a neighborhood like Las Vegas. I heard the statistic of the day, one in nine homes in Las Vegas is in foreclosure. There are stronger and weaker areas of the economy in the housing market, sure. But it's very risky right now for the bank to lend money. And believe me, I'm sure they want to. They would love to charge 5% mortgages uh, and, and, and pay 1% savings. So if they're not lending and making money for mortgages, where's, where are they lending? Where are they, where are they putting their money to reinvest their money to make money? Can they afford to give their employees raises? Now, and, they, and somebody made the point before, uh, what, well, the real problem is everything. People can't pay their mortgages because of the job losses. The job, jobs are down because corporations don't have confidence in the economy. The people don't have confidence, the corporations don't have confidence in the economy because they say, they say, well, there's more regulation, uh, there's higher health care costs, there's a lot more, you know, expenses and there's a lot more risk. You know, if you own the business right now or if you own a business, are you confident enough about the economy to hire more people? Pay more health care charges. Now, the, my answer is, I think the answer is in fiscal policy. That there has to be lower taxes and, and less regulation. That's my opinion. I think monetary policy, we're already near zero. What's really fascinating is about 63 minutes from now, Ben Bernanke is going to give us his opinion. I could go on about this for hours, by the way. Unfortunately, I'm out of time. I do love it, though, uh, in your opinion. I want to thank you all very, very much for joining us. If you want to contact me directly, www.4a.com. Very special thanks to FX Street. By the way, please see their calendar because next month we have a lot to talk about. Again, thank you very much for joining us. Wish you a great day. All profitable trades. And we look forward to seeing you.